2 Corinthians. See if I can get just a little more volume and I can speak more quietly. Cheat a little bit. Is that better, Chuck? Can you hear me? Chuck, nice shoes. You got new shoes? They're good. They got in here faster. It was early. Who knew? All he needed was a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Stacy, that's a great passage of Scripture. You know, I think every church member should memorize the qualifications for a pastor. You got to know what the qualifications for a pastor are. You know, um, in the last year, I've had I don't know how many people call me and say, "How do we get? How do we find a pastor for our church?" And I've had people call me and say, "How do we get rid of our pastor in our church?" And uh, I'm only half kidding about that. Uh, I'm actually I probably shouldn't kid about it. It's probably true. And uh, because because pastors don't meet the scriptural qualifications, it's a big deal. It's an important issue. Uh, it's important for a church to have a good article of faith doctrinal statement that defines what they believe that they're accountable to that the pastor is accountable to but you know really it doesn't mean much if a man doesn't isn't under authority isn't under the authority of the scripture and he isn't under the authority or with the authority of the congregation you know so I don't know what the scripture says about those things I don't think everybody those are passages everyone ought to learn that scripture uh, in first Timothy I mean sorry first John chapter 4 is also another vital one, Anthony. That was wonderful. You guys ever saying that? The love of love is love one another, for love is of God, and everyone love with this born of God, know of God, he love with not, know of God, for God is love, the love of love is love one another. Let's try it. Let's sing it. If you don't know it, it'll help you to memorize it. Ready? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. Cha-cha-cha. <laughs> our, our, our kids camp at, uh, in Delray, somehow cha-cha-cha got put in there. I think from that, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, or loveth not. No, it's not God, for God is love. So I think the clap, clap, clap turned into a cha-cha-cha somehow. And it just got put in at the wrong time. I'm not quite sure about that. You want to sing it again? <laughs> How many of y'all never sang that before? Sing it before? Oh, let's learn it. Let's, let's sing it a few times if we get down. That way you can learn scripture. Uh, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. Cha cha cha. Okay. I'm sorry, cha 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 got into my rendition as well as the bad rhythm. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, chapter 1. And I would like to read just a couple of verses this evening. Uh, and matter of fact, let me just read uh, verse 23 and 24, and then we will just look at a couple of simple, helpful truths. This is sort of an introduction, actually, into a series that I've been praying about preaching. And uh, so we're, we're moving into it gradually. Verse 23 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible says, this is Paul speaking, uh, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. Now we'll pray. Father, please help us to understand the heart of your apostle. And please help us understand how that you work with human beings who are mere humans. And I just pray that by this example, we would see you more than we would see the example of the man. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said, I But I determined this with myself, that I would not come unto you again in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote the same unto you, lest when I come, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. And so on. And he is speaking, I believe it's pretty clear from the context, he's speaking of the scathing letter that he penned to the church, which is inspired in our scripture as the first letter to the Corinthians. Historically, we know that Paul wrote four letters to the church at Corinth. The other two letters had no claim of being inspired of being scripture. And so sometimes uh, guys that know about the other two letters will say, well, this isn't really the second letter. Well, it's the second inspired letter to the church at Corinth, and the reference in this letter to making people sorry and uh, being not wanting to have that ministry with them this time around has to do in particular with the man who had committed sin. He was in a disgusting relationship, and because of the sin that he had committed, Paul had rebuked the church at Corinth for allowing it not for being involved with it, but for allowing it and for not turning over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And so uh, now Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, evidently because the man has been handled biblically, they responded in the right way to his letter, now Paul is saying, okay, now restore him. That's what you'll see in chapter 2 is Paul saying, you know, you don't want it to be over, or, uh, overcome with overmuch sorrow. Sorrow is what we're looking for. Repentance is what we're looking for. Getting right is what we're looking for. And now let's now that he has responded to, you know, the being turned over to Satan, now that he's responded to it, now restore him. Now, there are people that say, well, the Bible doesn't expressly say that. Well, it refers to a man in a book of the scripture that doesn't have things included for no reason. Do you believe? Do you believe in the preservation of the scripture? Do you believe God gave the scripture? You think that anything is in our Bible because uh, it's just there because we want it to be? Well, I don't. I believe what, I believe what the Bible claims. I believe if God gave a perfect book. God can keep a perfect book. And if there's doubt, if there's doubt in that matter, then we don't have any authority. We just um, we just believe whatever. And the fact of the matter is that there's a reference to a man, and it's not just for that church at Corinth. It's for us as well. And that man, I believe, is the man in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, if you read about that. Okay, now, that's not the point of the text this evening, but I'm preaching a topical message, and I don't want to preach without context. I don't want to ignore the context of the Scripture. Everything that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, really, except for, I would say, perhaps chapter 15, where he dealt with the resurrection and dealt with the gospel and just the clarification of the gospel and the resurrection and how that our bodies are one day going to be resurrected along with our, uh, along with our souls. Uh, everything except for that, I would say, in 1 Corinthians was y'all are doing uh, terribly and uh, you are, the church is a mess because of how you're doing. I mean, there just, there just wasn't anything positive in 1 Corinthians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in that instance. And the reason there wasn't any pos anything positive is because there was so much wrong with that church. And i tell you something. I, I, there's two things I don't like to be a, from the position of leadership. I don't like to be whiny, and I don't like to be angry. I just don't like to. You know, sometimes things grieve me, and I feel like it comes across more as whining or complaining when you talk about the things that bother you. Or it comes across sometimes as I'm mad or I'm angry about something. And I, I do think that when things are grievous, that that does need at the appropriate time to be expressed. I do feel like some men's ministries are just all grievous. It's just everything is wrong. Uh, I, I, I know preachers, it just seems like everywhere they go, they just, they just get involved with pastoring terrible people. Just everywhere they go, their people are just terrible. And I just think, my goodness, is everybody that you've ever met just terrible? Am I the only one that meets you know, great people and gets to pastor great people? <laughs> is everybody in the world terrible? And I think that's the perspective. Uh, but I will say that everything isn't always wonderful. Uh, I was telling somebody, uh, somebody this, um, 
I guess this last week that I was chatting with from another ministry, and I said, you know, there have been times, I said, I've never, I've always loved our ministry, I said, but there have been times when I haven't, I always have thought our church is the best church. There's been times when I haven't liked our church. I'm not talking about our people, I'm just talking about, I just don't like the way we are. Uh, we don't love souls the way we ought to. We don't have a fire for the Lord Jesus the way that we should. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about I don't like the people or I don't like, or I would like to go somewhere else, but we just, I just don't like our attitude. It stinks. I'm not saying that about right now. But that's a reality. Sometimes that has to be addressed, doesn't it? Folks, if we're not winning any lost people, we're not what Jesus wants us to be. We have to be real about things like that. And we have to say, okay, what's going on with us? What's the cause? What's the effect? And how do we correct it? How do we get right? If we're not what Jesus wants us to be, we're wrong. We're not right. We need to get right. We need that. There's a place for that, isn't there? I also believe that there is a place for build-up and for edification. And uh, there are a place, there's a place for encouragement. I personally look at the Sunday night service in our church as kind of an uplifting service. I don't know if you feel that way about it, but I do. You may notice I'm usually pretty happy. By the way, I spared you this evening after we sang the song uh, Saved by Grace. I spared you my grace joke. Just want you to know, I didn't tell my grace joke. I almost felt obligated every time that song is sung to get up and tell my grace joke, and I did not tell it this evening. And so you can be grateful. Uh, if you've heard it before, you didn't have to hear it again. If you've never heard it before, well, I'm very sorry, but the other people here are so mean that they would not like me to tell you my joke. So it's just the way it is. Uh, <laughs> but I do see the Sunday night service as an uplifting service, and I hope you do as well. And so uh, I want, I, I've been praying about, I, I think the Lord's been showing me some things. I, I've been wanting to kind of preach topically for a little while, and I think I probably will. And I know that isn't, isn't typically what I do, but I have been on Sunday nights for a little while. So I plan on doing that. I'm going to be preaching a series on good examples of bad examples in the Scripture. So good examples of bad examples. And one of the reasons, one of the motivations for it has been that I've noticed in Christianity the idea or the notion that if it happened in the Bible, then God wanted it. And I'm talking about, you know, if it happened, well, you know, Jacob had, you know, he, he had two wives and he had his wife's, uh, his wife's servants, and so polygamy is in the Bible. I heard a preacher preach polygamy based on they did it in the Old Testament a while back. I'm serious. I'm serious. I heard a preacher play, preach polygamy because, well, you know, they did polygamy in the Old Testament. You know, so the the notion that what happened and, and the Bible, the Scripture records it, so you know it was okay because they did it in the Bible. You know, but did you know those people actually lived in tents on land? They didn't live in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, they really didn't. So, but there is a notion. There's a, there's a mindset. I'm I, I'm not kidding you. A lot of things that people are confused about, and they the believers actually think, well, you know, it happened. And so some things are given for us for examples, for good examples. For instance, isn't Hebrews 11 about good examples? Yes. You could take the people in Hebrews 11 and look at their bad examples, but Hebrews 11 is about examples of faith, for instance. And so I like to accurately preach some helpful messages of good examples of bad examples. And this message this evening really isn't that way. This is just a good example of how God works and how God leads in the life of believers. You know, sometimes as Christians... Uh, we are living days or times of uncertainty. Every one of us is called to be ministers of Christ. We're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us is called to preach the gospel. I get frustrated sometimes when the pastor is called preacher. I, I don't think it's a bad term. A pastor ought to be a preacher, right? But uh, you know what the preaching is, right? At Caruso, I proclaim the gospel. Preaching is preaching the gospel. And biblically speaking, uh, every believer is called to be a preacher, including the ladies. So when you talk about women preachers, I don't have a problem with women preachers, actually, because God doesn't. God calls women to be preachers. Now, they're not supposed to preach in the church. They're not supposed to you know, usurp authority in the church. The Bible is very, very clear about that. They're not supposed to pastor. But the Scripture does teach that all of us are to preach the gospel. We're all supposed to preach the gospel. It's not, a, you know, the pastor. Uh, pastors pastor. Pastors teach. 
and pastors preach because they're Christians. That's what they do. But uh, if you if you look at uh, many passages of Scripture, for instance, but uh, Ephesians chapter four would be a, a wonderful one there, where there's a TSKS construction. Scramble sharp and doesn't mean anything to you. It shouldn't mean too much, but. Uh, in the reference when the Bible talks about and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers is in a construction where one renames the other. And so a pastor is required to have the gift of being the teacher. And that's what he is in the church. He's a teacher. And he's other things too. He's a shepherd. He's, a, he's not the shepherd. He is one who shepherds. And so he pastors people. And that's a uh, scriptural, biblical requirement. Uh, so there are some things that, term-wise, term are frustrating about the way that people say things. But the Scripture does give us some uh, wonderful examples of how preachers, that's all of us, follow the Lord's leading. Paul was an apostle. We don't have any apostles today, so there's no one who's an equivalent. So uh, I know a lot of times uh, we pastors are, are pretty guilty of reading ourselves into offices like you know well you know I can see myself as the Apostle Paul in the story are you the hero of every story that you read the hero of every storybook that you read are you the villain I'm the villain of every story I'm like I'd take that guy out I get that guy. I'd kill the good guy I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> are you the hero of every story you read huh no boy you're boring people no wonder we have such a spineless lack of courage in our society today. You people don't know what a hero is and how to be a hero. I had a nightmare about courage the other day. I had to be courageous and nobody else would. It was terrible. Anyway, I'm the hero of every story I read. I'm the good guy. Every story. I'm the guy that said the clever thing. I'm the guy who did the right thing. You know, I'm the guy who stood up. I'm the guy who sat down, the guy who whatever did what needed to be done. You know, whoever the hero of the story is, then I see myself as that person. And we all should, actually, uh, because there should be good and evil. See, we, we've actually, this is this is a little sidetrack, but I'll throw this at you because I want you to think about it and uh, help you with your with your thinking. We have been in, uh, brainwashed in the last uh, 20 years or so with regard to good and evil. Uh, superhero stories, the villain is no longer, there's no such thing as a villain anymore. Have you noticed that? Uh, animated television makes uh, spooky, ter terrifying things lovable. Monsters, Inc., for instance, would be a good example of that. Makes monsters good. You know, makes and then just makes them fuzzy and cuddly and lovable. And one monster is bad, but the rest of them are all good monsters. Monsters think. You say, Pastor, that's funny. I know it's funny. I like it. Uh, but it warps our thinking a little bit. Um, Despicable Me. Despicable Me, the movie. Makes villains adorable. Mm -hmm. Makes them cute. Makes them funny. Makes killing not real. Just makes... It blurs the lines. It makes the good guys stupid. It makes the bad guys be good at guys in the end. Makes good guys out of villains. And actually, if you'll think about it, you know, all of the superheroes and so forth, um, they cross over. You know, they, they uh, do, I don't watch Batman, but I've read the storyline of it. It's, it's not something I think a Christian should watch. But um, I've read the storyline of it. Batman basically becomes a criminal. You know, and it's, he's a good guy for doing it. So there's no more, you know, Elliot Ness, if you will. Like, the, you know, this guy's going to stop evil. And he's not going to cross lines, he's not going to blur lines to do it. And we've lost that as Christians, actually. I've noticed that there's a lack of shame in our culture today. Have you noticed it? People just do evil and they, and they, they don't even, they, there's not even enough shame to try to hide it or to act as though they haven't done it. So it's a problem. Well, that's a little bit of a veering off course this evening, but I want to look at a character example. And this is really in our text tonight how the Apostle Paul uh, was led of God, how the Holy Spirit led. We know that God was very, very vivid at times and very, very clear at times, wasn't he, in leading the Apostle Paul? Let's talk about the first time Paul met God. How'd that go down? Remember? 
He's on the road to Damascus, and he just had a bad feeling about about going to kill Christians and had a change of heart. Is that how it went? No. <laughs> there was a bright light blinded the people there. He heard a loud voice, scared everybody to death. And God said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, God said, Saul, don't go there. It's like kicking an ox goad. And it's difficult for you. It's not going to work out. God broke Saul. Broke his will. He had a very, very vivid conversion, didn't he? You read in the Acts how that the apostles are traveling, and the Bible says they were forbidden in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit forbade them. They do something. The Spirit said, don't do that. You read about Philip, for instance. Remember how he ended up being, uh, after he'd had such a fantastic time preaching the gospel in Samaria, and everybody got saved, and then the Spirit of God led Philip to basically the wilderness or desert place in Gaza, and he joined himself to the chariot. And then after the Ethiopian was saved, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. The eunuch saw him in the morning. He went on his way rejoicing. I mean, sometimes the spit leading of the Spirit is just very, very vivid. It's very, there's no question that this is what I would have you to do. Uh, I think of Peter when he was in prison. After James, you know, the job, brother John, he was, he was killed with the sword. And then after they killed James, then they were going to kill Peter too, and they locked him up. And they locked him up because they were going to kill him. And the angel of the Lord came at nighttime and said, Hey, Peter, come follow me. And he walked out of the prison and led him and said, You know, go to this house where the people are praying. And it was pretty, pretty vivid, wasn't it? Peter's direction, Peter's leading. And I will say to you, Christian, that there are times when God meets with you in exactly that way. For most of us, our conversion was that way. Most of us, when we came to know Jesus as our Savior, the, the circumstance or the events of it made it so that we were under deep conviction. For most of us, I'm not saying it's universally so, but most of us realized this is literally a turning point. This may be the final call. This may be the last chance. And God dealt with us very, very... It's okay, brother. You can kill it. It's all right. One time there was a roach right here, one of those oriental roaches, and uh, Sue Colella was watching it. And so I had to stop and kill it, you know, because it's just going to fly around and distract people. And so you just got to do what you got. Thanks for stepping up. So I just know you're distractible on Sunday night. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. What distracted me is about your wife getting after you for killing. The <laughs> I see everything. I see Taz texting over here or watching the game, and I see you guys. I see, I see it all. <laughs> Anyway, um, sometimes God deals with us very vividly. When I got saved, when I was saved, I mean, it was, you need to do this. Uh, I remember being a teenager in the Spirit of God really dealing with me about my call to preach the gospel, a call to be full-time in the ministry and be a pastor. And um, actually, Stacy's first verse this evening was my verse that night. You know, if a man desire the office of the bishop, it's a good work. And uh, was that your first verse? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, I didn't quite hear that part, but then I heard the rest after that. I've, I'm going deaf. Uh, anyway, um, I remember that. That was that was in my in my life. That was a vivid call. Uh, I just I had some times in college where I just God clarified the manner of ministry that I was called to. Just put in my heart some things, and I just this is it. You know, though, a lot of the time, uh, matter of fact, most of the time, uh, God doesn't just, you know, grab my attention and send me straight on a mission. A lot of times, He just guides me. He leads me. And this is an example of what we see in the text this evening. And I, I want us to just see, not Paul, because I think that would be a distraction. I think sometimes we look at men and we think, okay, this is what we're supposed to be. But the Bible doesn't command us to be like any man. And Paul actually explained that very, very clearly in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but God does move us. And we, so I want to look at God, how God works. So let's do it real quick. We'll take too long. 
uh, in chapter uh, 1, the Bible says in verse 23, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. And I can relate to this, not just because I'm always the hero in the story, but many, many times I have withheld from dealing with something uh, because I didn't want to destroy it. Uh, <laughs> I probably should now. Okay, let's get it. give an example. But I won't. Uh, many times I have decided this is not the right time. I need to have some distance, have some clarity. And this is a pretty good principle, actually, for discipline here. And actually, it's in context. This is Paul with his apostolic authority disciplining a church at Corinth. He said, if I come to you, I will not spare. That's what he said. You know. So uh, in this context, he said, I call for God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Now, several weeks ago, you remember when we talked about Corinth and what it was to Paul? Corinth was that first place that Paul really had a rest in his ministry for a long time. So it was a really dear church to Paul. Keep that in mind, will you? And Paul literally lambasted the church of Corinth in the first letter to Corinth. But Paul also had probably his best ministry experience while in Corinth. Read about that in Acts. It literally is a place of rest, and he was not persecuted while there. He was given a respite for a very long time. And so Corinth was a special place in his heart. But there were things wrong, and he said, if I come there while things are wrong, there are going to be casualties. And the goal was not to have casualties. The goal was to have people get right. And so he said, I'm just telling you, God's my, God's my witness, that I didn't come there when I wanted to, or when I planned to, and the reason I didn't come you know, wasn't because I was afraid to come and talk to you guys after I wrote that letter. It, I came, I didn't come because I was afraid that I wouldn't deal with you the right way when I came. And we should all be aware of that, shouldn't we? Sometimes people really, really try hard to push your buttons or push you in to dealing with something when the time isn't right. And it isn't that you, that you wouldn't do what's right, but the time to do right isn't right. And timing is important as believers. Uh, I've learned that whenever I correct somebody in a public manner, that that's not good timing. Right? It's not good timing. It's not a good time to do it. It's not, it's not well received. People don't like it. And if I did the same thing in a private manner, it would probably be well received. And so it's just the timing. It's the timing of the matter that makes the difference. So that's what Paul's saying here in verse in, in the last couple of verses of 1 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 1. Then he said, not for that we have dominion over your faith. He said, I don't, this, it's not the attitude that we're coming in that we're going to come in and you know just crush or destroy or like that, that we are more than the authority God made us to be. How much authority did Paul have as an apostle in the church of Corinth? How much authority did he have? I mean, if Paul said it, that was it. He spoke for God. Now, I'm not speaking Pope-like here. Paul didn't claim to be a Pope. He had a great deal more humility than any Pope has ever had. And so he just simply said, we don't have dominion over you, over your faith. We're helpers of your joy by faith you stand. But in verse 1 of chapter 2, he said, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. Okay. Now let's go down to uh, verse 12. We see Paul, because of circumstances, when he would have felt led to go to the church at Corinth, didn't. That's what we saw so far, right? Does everybody get that? Paul said, I didn't come there because the timing wasn't right. If I'd come... When I planned on coming, that would have been before you got right. And if I'd come before you had gotten right, then you'd have been nuked. And that's pretty much the way it is. I don't know they think that's so funny, but I guess it's a little funny. Anyway, <laughs> that's the way I said it, I suppose. Anyway, verse uh, 12, though, uh, 
Now let's read verse 11. He said this is one of the reasons that we should do things the right way. Verse 11, lest Satan should get advantage of us if we are not ignorant of his devices. So verse 11 really gives a good reason why Paul did what he did. He said, I do not want to do something that I believe is right and have it be effective in Satan's device or be an effective device for Satan. Has anyone ever been in the right and really worked out or really done the work of the Satan? I think so. Well, you say, well, they're not actually right. Well, you'd be true in saying that, but I'm talking about could you prove you're right? Could you back up what you say with the evidence? Does the Scripture stand with you instead of you standing with the Scripture? But does the Scripture support what you said? Well, you, it could, yeah. But it could be that you didn't do it the right way. That is, you weren't led by the Spirit. If you're not led by the Spirit, being right is something you own. And actually, this morning when we were talking about Judas, Judas would be a pretty good example of a fellow who's usually pretty well right, except he was wrong. He made good points about things that he said, except that he wasn't led by the Spirit. And so, he was wrong. And this is what Paul said. He said, we don't, I don't want to be a tool of Satan. I don't want to come and destroy the church of Corinth. I want to get the church right. Boy, it would be good if some pastors would learn what the Apostle Paul learned, wouldn't it? I'm not. My job isn't to get rid of problem people. My job is to pastor people and help with their problems. It really, it really is the reality of it. I'm not, I'm not supposed to, you know, well, that one's a problem. Let's figure out how to get rid of them. Uh, honestly, there's a lot of guys go into the ministry and they just look at people like, oh, you've, pro you've got problems. Let me ask you a question. How many people have problems? Everybody does. If you get rid of the problems uh, instead of help with the problems, how many people we have to pastor? Churches are dying today because of that. Churches are struggling because of trying to get rid of problems instead of trying to help people with problems. And there is a difference. So Paul said, you know, I didn't want to be a tool of Satan. And if I had dealt with you, I would have been technically correct. However, I would have been used by the devil. Christian, there's a good principle there, isn't there? When God leads, the results are godly. Does that make sense? When God's leading, the results are godly. You have the right kind of results. If you're dealing with people that are wrong, people get right. If you're dealing with people that are lost, People get saved when the Lord's in it. Now, here's an interesting one, though. Look at verse uh, 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel. Okay, so why did Paul go to Troas? I know you're trying to you know, read the end of the story there, but why did he go to Troas? To preach Christ's gospel. That's a good motive, isn't it? And then we see the second part. He says, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Okay, so Paul said, Something moreover, is here something in uh, addition to what we've already said. When I went to Troas to preach the gospel, he said, a door was opened on me in, of the Lord. He said, I had no rest in my spirit for I, because I found not Titus my brother. But pastor, look at the results. He went to Troas and there was an open door for the gospel there. And then he said, but I didn't have rest in my spirit because I didn't find Titus my brother. Now, I don't know about you, but when I study the Scripture and I'm reading along and I'm like, uh-huh, 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 sometimes things just stick out. I'm like, what? And what does that have to do with anything? If you were to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, wouldn't you ask that question? What does that have to do with anything? And how is it significant? And I'll remind you, it's significant first. Why? Preserved. What? It's preserved. Yeah. It's Say it loud, Charlie. You're right. Go ahead. Because it's preserved. It's preserved. It's in God's Word. In other words, it's not there for no reason. Friends, you guys are laughing at me for memorizing First Chronicles, and I mean it's actually not even a joke. Uh, the the genealogies of First Chronicles are really key in understanding the timeline of the Old Testament of the Scripture. A lot of times when you study the Old Testament of the Scripture, you know, it's like, oh, they're, they're, they're not chronological. The Old Testament isn't chronological. 
So when you know the genealogies, you really know what's all the contemporary events that are happening when you read the name of a person. And so that's why I'm actually memorizing First Chronicles. And those genealogies have a lot, a lot. They're packed with preaching. They're packed with application. Little stories in the Chronicles. And so uh, that's there. There's it's it's not by accident that it's in the Scripture. It's inspired. And I've been helped a great deal by learning some things that it's like, well, what is that there for? Well, this is a what's that there for verse, though, isn't it? I mean, right in the middle of talking about restoring a man, and then Paul says, moreover, when I went to Troas, I had no rest in my spirit. Uh, you know, a, a, a door was opened unto me. You know, the spirit was leading, the gospel was being preached. And I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother, so I left. And I just think I wouldn't have done that. I don't think. Would you? What's the purpose of a Christian? What, I mean, if you want to say, what is a believer supposed to do? What do we do? What? Glorify God. We glorify God. How do we do it? Proclaim the gospel. What? Proclaim the gospel. Yeah, we proclaim the gospel, right? Everything Jesus said when he ascended to heaven was, go ye therefore. In other words, so everything we do, yeah, we need to glorify God. We need to do that by preaching the gospel. I mean, God's pretty into the gospel preaching thing. It's a pretty radical understatement. When you understand that, you study the scripture in light of that, you really come to have this dimension. So here Paul is at Troas. He's preaching the gospel, and there's an effectual door. There is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I think it's verses 8 and 9, a similar statement where Paul says that there was an effective or effectual door open to preach the gospel in a context where it was just it was a it was a vernacular to use. Let's go ahead and look at it. See everybody is uh, going there. So it's uh, 1 Corinthians 16, um, verse 8, verse 9. He so in verse 8, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now that's an interesting message by itself there. And it doesn't it would fit with this evening's except that I need to be done already, so we'll go there. But Paul said, When I was at Ephesus, there was a great and effectual door open to me, and there's many adversaries. So the idea is God is using me very, very effectively, and it's a it's the right place to be. And yet, with a very, very similar term, Paul uses the same phrases, the same terms, to say in verse 12 of chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. And then he immediately follows it by saying, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. And then he said, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. And actually, that's pretty much... Um, that's pretty much all he mentions about that. He goes on to talk about something else. But actually, that's pretty much all that Paul says about going to Macedonia. I, I, I'm left with some questions. Uh, did you find Titus at Macedonia? Uh, was, was Titus there in Macedonia? Because we know Titus was where in Crete later on. So was Titus in Macedonia? I don't know if Titus was in Macedonia or not. But what I do know is that the Holy Spirit included this in the Scripture, and I believe that it falls within the context. If you read chapter 1, the end of the chapter, where Paul is talking about uh, how that God led him not to go to Corinth, I believe that it also indicates here that God, again, led him not to go to Corinth. And the way that God led him not to go to Corinth was that things really went great in in. Uh, Troas, with the exception that Titus wasn't there and he just didn't feel right. And so he went, so he went to Macedonia. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> you look at me like, no, Pastor, it's not interesting. <laughs> I think it's interesting. Because it, it's in the Scripture, and so it's there. Why? What purposes? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly really furnished in every good work. And I believe the reason it's there is for us to ask the question, why is it there? I think God does that sometimes, don't you? I don't think Paul, you know, uh, with, the, with the Holy Spirit, I don't know about Paul the person, but Paul inspired by the Spirit, 
I don't think struggle with the rabbit trail thing. He writes long sentences, but they're not rabbit trails. So what is this? Why did Paul end up in Macedonia instead of staying in Troas? What'd you say, Chuck? The spirit led him. Yeah. In other words, his small spirit had no rest. You say, well, Pastor, I know why it is. It's because he was so angry. <laughs> That's what he said in chapter 1. I can make a great message on that, right? We can write a book <laughs> on anger and its effects. Yes? Didn't he at Macedonia meet Luke? That's when Luke first appeared on the scene? I think that's right. So I think maybe that's, that's right. That's the reason why sometimes we think God wants us to go one way and he has us go another. And... Well, he ended up going to Rome. That's the ultimate answer. He ended up in Rome. And that's where he was supposed to go. So, I mean, if you want to talk about where did he end up as a result of it, he ended up in Rome is where the final destination was. And perhaps Corinth would have distracted from that. But that's speculation. That's speculation. Actually, all the questions that I could possibly ask about this context, about what would have happened if he remained at Troas, are nothing more than speculation because the Scripture flat out does not say. And so, I'm left with a very simple conclusion that sometimes God disrupts us to move us. Sometimes instead of a bright light, instead of a Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Sometimes instead of shaking the prison and leading you out, sometimes the Holy Spirit of God just forbids you. And that's the way He works. And that's the way He moves. And because that's true, you and I need to be careful about stubbornness about we don't want to be flighty I realize that I'm more concerned about that sometimes than people staying anchored because it just seems like Christians just bob around and never really become effective in serving the Lord but we need God's peace it's one of the fruits of a Christian it's one of the things that are particularly evidences for us not only of God's love but of God's will and my friend if you don't have it if you don't have it better go somewhere where you will and I think that's pretty important for us to realize for Paul it was geographic for us, it may be vocational, it may be educational, it may be a, a, just an associate, an affiliation, a friendship. It could be any number of things, but it's never what God wants if we don't have rest in our spirit. And again, this evening, I will emphasize the emphasis here tonight, I believe in the Scripture, is not Paul. The emphasis here in the Scripture is God and His Spirit. And I hope it's a help to you. I don't think that God's plan, God's will is ambiguous, undefined, and we just, you know, roll around based on how we feel. But God's peace is something that really is basically guaranteed for people that are in fellowship with Him. And if you take off all of the check marks on fellowship and you don't have God's peace, you don't have rest in your spirit, which means there needs to be some movement or some change in direction. Father, thank You for what You've taught us this evening. I pray that You'd help us to apply it as we need it, when we need it. Lord, sometimes we learn things and then we don't remember them this would be something that we would need to remember in order to be able to apply. So I ask for help with that as well. 
In Jesus' name, amen. A couple things. Uh, choir practice, or music practice, whatever it is. Charlie will let you know, so be available for that. And then Anthony's 18. He had a birthday on Friday, November the 3rd. And we're going to go to CeCe's in a little bit if it's not too late. So, I don't know, what time does CeCe's close? I'll Google it. I'll give you a word on that. But if you'd like to go and celebrate Anthony's birthday at CeCe's, you're invited. It's not anything official. Uh, or you could just give him 100 bucks. <laughs> Luke? You're dismissed. Luke says you're dismissed. I'm not sure you